right now in the studio. Back with us, uh, she was just here a couple of weeks ago from Safe Place, Jennifer Fatma. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for the time again today. My pleasure. Thank you. When you were here last, we uh, talked about what sounded like a dire financial situation at Safe Place. What update can you give us today? Well, we've made a dent okay. in, uh, in the dollars that we need, and that is truly only because of the generosity of the citizens of this community. Okay. Um, people saying, I'm going to up my donation. People saying, uh, you know, I've, I've got a few extra dollars, and I'm going to decide to give that to Safe Place. So uh, really overwhelming generosity. Um, I wish I could say someone came in at some company, said, this is where we do business, and I want this to be a safe community. I'm going to write you a check. Nobody has done that. Um, but like I said, just really overwhelming generosity from uh, just the neighbors, you know, our, our neighbors in this community. Mm-hmm. So where are we now as far as what you need? Uh, we're, uh, I would say, about 25% of the way there. Okay. Um, and so we've got a little bit of time, but I'm still not sleeping. And, uh, you know, I do think that it's out there. I really do. I think that, uh, you know, 12 years ago when I started at Safe Place, I would have never imagined um, the support that law enforcement, for example, is giving us right now. Every single law enforcement agency in, in Calhoun County, tribal, even the state police that are here have all said domestic violence is important. We are receiving training on it, and we are going to make sure um, that we are there for victims, that as first responders, we're going to send a message that um, this is not okay. I'd have never imagined that 12 years ago. So in some ways, we're, you know, just miles ahead of where I thought we would be. Um, but in the funding arena, you know, it still is um, – it's difficult because we have to earn every dollar. There's there's nothing just handed to us. Right. Everything is a competitive grant or the generosity of our community. And these are crime victims. Mm-hmm. So that's, I think, been the biggest surprise and the biggest struggle. I'm curious about something you said, that, that uh, years ago uh, there wasn't as much of a commitment among law enforcement to recognize and follow up on, on domestic violence cases as there is today. What, what was what's what was that about? I think that the commitment was there. Mm-hmm. I think the understanding was not. We've ah. all learned a lot um, that this really, there is nothing that a victim can do to prevent this, to keep themselves safe. Uh, they are, there are some preventive things they can do, but but it's the assailant's choice. And, and so just like any crime, you know, like, like I'm fond of saying, I've never heard a gunshot victim ask, well, why weren't you wearing a bulletproof vest? Mm-hmm. And yet with domestic violence victims, well, why didn't you just leave? If it were that easy, uh, they would. But right. the bottom line is leaving does not end the violence. It doesn't. Um, and the number one reason people don't leave is fear, kind of that scared to stay, afraid to leave. And so we understand that better now. So uh, much of the challenge that you've had this year or leading up to now has been as a result of more effective follow-up on domestic violence situations? I think, yeah, it, it's um, a combination of things. Like I said last time I was here, over the last three years, we've had an 84% increase in our nights of shelter, 84%. Wow. That's tremendous. Um, and, and a lot of that is because uh, there's been a lot more exposure of the issue uh, in the media, a lot uh, better response from first first responders, a lot better um, there's just less of a stigma about it, and there shouldn't be any, mm-hmm. uh, but there is. There's still a lot of victim blaming going on, um, but a far less than there was before. And with greater understanding, people are now reaching out for help that didn't in the past. Jennifer Fatma's here from Safe Place. We'll take a short break and come back on WBCK 815. 16, WBCK, Jennifer Fatma's here from Safe Place. So do you have a point at which you say, okay, we, we have to have this funding gap bridged by this day or we start changing our business model? Well, I am uh, every Monday, well, and every day, but especially every Monday, I relook at all the finances. Um, and, you know, I don't know that we have kind of that drop-dead day, mm-hmm. but I can tell you um, if we uh, don't hit that 70000 mark, and, it's, and it, especially if it's not looking like we're going to, I would certainly say six months within our fiscal year, which would be April, we're going to have to start making some decisions. Mm-hmm. So uh, how do you uh, view the problem then given this? I mean, we've become better at identifying it, mm-hmm. become better at 
helping people overcome the stigma and get away from these situations, but this is what comes with it. And so how do you deal with that? Do you, I mean, I presume this funding uh, disparity right now is just one part of the problem. You go beyond this into future months and years, we presume that what you do is going to be in greater demand. Yeah, it's interesting because I've always said I want to put myself out of work. Yeah. Um, but I wanted that to be because there was no more domestic violence, <laughs> not because, right. uh, you know, we didn't have the funds to support our victims. So uh, I think that Safe Place will certainly always be there. There's always going to be, well, at least as long as there's a need for victims, I should say, we're going to be there. I do believe we're, we're going to uh, put ourselves out of business one day, certainly, or we wouldn't come to work every day if we mm-hmm. didn't truly believe that was possible. Right. Uh, and especially as we continue to hold assailants accountable. That, you know, that really is the secret to it, is holding assailants accountable because um, there is a shelter for batters. It's called jail. They are funded. Um, and so we need to start using using that instead of uh, our victims. But we do owe our crime victims something. We need to send the message uh, that they're valued, that it was good for them to come forward, um, that we support them in coming forward. And we do want to get people who are hurtful off the streets. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, when this whole Bill Cosby thing started mm-hmm. to uh, take flight here in the last week or two, uh, you came to mind because that situation is different but similar yes. to those which you see. Make the distinction for us, if you would. Well, interestingly, the same thing. What happened, uh, the current uh, criminal charges, uh, that woman came forward. Well, it happened in 2004. Mm-hmm. Uh, in 2005, uh, she reported it, and nothing happened. Nothing happened criminally. And so she decided to file a civil suit. There were 13 other Jane Doe victims, Right, 13 at that time, um, he settled that case, but it just kind of disappeared. So we knew at that time, or somebody knew, people knew that there were at least 14 young women who had allegedly been raped by Bill Cosby. It wasn't until 2014 when a comedian made a joke about it, a male comedian made a joke about it on stage. And one of the victims then took the opportunity to write an op-ed piece for the Washington Post saying, why did it take a male comedian to bring this to light when several victims have been, you know, raising our hands about this? So I think a lot of people think, oh, this is just happening now. Why are they all coming forward now when really, you know, this is a Mm decade-long issue. People have been coming forward. But when you come forward and nothing happens – other victims aren't going to come forward either. So oh, they're w- they're watching yeah. to see, you know, what's going to happen. And unfortunately, um, time has run out for several of the victims. And this one, time, the clock was ticking. Yes. I understand uh, January, right now. Right. Uh, if they hadn't filed charges, it would have been too late for her as well. Jennifer Fotmas here from Safe Place. We'll pick up in just a minute on WBCK. 23 WBCK, Jennifer Fotmas here from Safe Place. So I guess there's a a similarity between the uh, stigma uh, with domestic violence and the stigma with sexual assault, right? They're they're somewhat similar. Absolutely, and that's why we have such a great working relationship with sexual assault services here in our community because they are so intertwined. In domestic violence, there's often rape associated with that. But, you know, in both cases, uh, you know, the assailant tends to be this nice guy. It's hard to believe. Um, even what were there, 30 uh, women came forward with the same story. 40 women came forward. 50 women came forward. And how many people still said, this is, this is a character assault. How dare you do mm-hmm. this to this great man right. um, who's so kind? And, and yet it wasn't until... Um, his own words said, yes, I gave women pills right. in order to incapacitate them. Until he said it, there were still people absolutely refusing to believe it, despite, you know, uh, uh, 50 women all coming forward and saying this happened to me. So it's no surprise a lot of people don't come forward in, in issues like this. Mm-hmm. I, I always try to look at things and say, you know what? Uh, there hasn't been a trial yet. There hasn't been a legal proceeding to confirm this, a unbiased look at the evidence. But, man, when you have a group that is this strong in number, have you ever seen a situation like this 
that has to do with domestic violence or or uh, sexual assault where there's so many accusers and there's not some kind of fire where there's smoke. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I, you know, um, people don't change their ways, especially without intervention. You know, this is mm-hmm. this is a behavior pattern, clearly. And there's been no intervention. There's been nothing to tell them you have to stop doing this. Um, in fact, like I said, typically it was the victims who were pushed aside and said, we're not going to press charges. Right. We don't believe you. It's a he said, she said. And worse yet, uh, Bill Cosby's own attorneys are, you know, filed defamation suits against yes. several of these victims. Yes. You know, that's a double whammy. Here's a, a, a woman who uh, has been raped and had the courage to come forward. And we know statistically. I mean, of course, there are, there are people who lie about things, but statistically, uh, very few people lie about rape because, I mean, look at what happens when you're telling the truth. Mm-hmm. You know, there's still consequences for telling the truth. You're you're dragged out. Your reputation, you know, is put in jeopardy. So, uh, you know, it just really um, is difficult for anyone to come forward. And for 50, I mean, that... I, that's a serial crime at that point. Mm-hmm. I don't know how, uh, it, and especially with his own words, it's hard to doubt. Like you said, there hasn't been a trial, but uh, um, it's, I don't, the, all the evidence it is certainly pointing there. in that mm-hmm. direction without question. One of the stories this weekend uh, pointed to Camille Cosby, uh, Bill's wife, who mm-hmm. uh, the attorneys were trying to stonewall a deposition that she's set to give on Wednesday in another case, a civil case, uh, that apparently doesn't have to do with the criminal uh, case that mm-hmm. suddenly has gained traction. But uh, that was unsuccessful, so she's going to have to give a deposition. And there's this part of the dynamic, maybe you've seen this before, where people close to a domestic violence or sexual assault situation are, are, are sort of swept up in this thing. Great point, Richard. I mean, this is uh, obviously, you know, his wife has said, and this is a woman who, who loves him, mm-hmm. has said, that I, I can't believe the man you're talking about. And she may not have seen that side of him. I think uh, in her gut, she probably, you know, with this many people coming forward, is starting to question some things. But uh, she's not the criminal here. Um, and, and for her to be astounded, at all of this and to be questioning things and to be confused and feel like um, I've known this man for years and I love him. I just, it's hard for me to believe. It's hard for a lot of people to believe. And the same with domestic violence. Often a victim's own family doesn't believe them because the assailant has done such a good job of, of painting this picture of, of being a, a caring you know person. So based on your experience, it is possible to, uh, let's say, be a domestic abuser and your immediate family who does not live with you does not see that often and even the victim's family they'll say you know she's been ill she's been drinking a lot um you know i think that that there are problems here Hmm. and the behavior of a victim can become erratic there's a lot of fear involved um and you know when we're scared Mm -hmm. we behave differently uh, than a typical day. So certainly a victim's behavior may change, but to me that indicates trauma. You know, So for, for those of us in the field, we recognize that behavior change as confirmation that a crime took place, not a doubt that a crime took place. Well, let that sink in a second. Mm-hmm. All right, so if folks listening want to help Safe Place uh, with, uh, with a, a donation of some sort, a big one, a small one, how do mm-hmm. they do it? safeplaceshelter.org. There's a donate button right there. So uh, as soon as you open up the web page, there it is. All right. Jennifer Fatma with Safe Place. We'll stay in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you. 820.